Hey, welcome back to Keeping Cozy. Today we're speaking with Janet Varney, the voice of Korra from Nickelodeon's The Legend of Korra. We talked to her a little bit about her roots moving to California and then also what it was like for her to land such an iconic role. Uh, and then we also talked specifically what it was like to take over such a you know, important role for so many people who loved the uh, Avatar The Last Airbender show what it was you know like dealing and navigating through those challenges so please be sure to like comment and subscribe and you know watch till the end so you can hear why she's a huge advocate for for improv comedy and thank you again for everyone who watches and please be sure to share with your friends thank you for your time yeah well well thank you so much for coming to the podcast and um yeah i guess i'd just like to start are you are you in california now or where are you i am yeah i'm in la so what is it like during um, during COVID and also all of the, you know, environmental disasters? Oh, my gosh. Well, it's been really hard. I mean, it's it's been, I think, for everybody, there's a sort of a level of kind of depression that um, is hard to avoid uh, just with the COVID thing alone because it's something that's so alien to most Americans. Um, we've been really lucky. You know, there's really not that many good reasons why why we haven't had to deal with a pandemic uh until now but um like the rest of the world you know just trying to cope with that stuff and then um to your point having the wildfire smoke and stuff i mean it's really hard like it's you know it's like a sad time when you're making a joke about like oh well I have all these K95 masks already from COVID. So I can just bust those out to walk the dogs. Like that is sad stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But I don't have, you know, I don't have kids and I really feel for people who are, you know, um, anywhere where the outside climate isn't, you know, kid friendly right now for one reason or the other to imagine being a parent and, you know, having to deal with like, stay inside, don't, but also don't see anyone and also don't be outside. I mean, that's just got to be so hard. Yeah. Yeah, well, kind of staying on California. I know you um, you grew up in Arizona, but you went to college in San Francisco. Um, so did you go to college knowing that it would be advantageous towards being in you know California to be an actor? And, you know, had you already decided on, you know, becoming an actor when you had gone to California? So I was I loved acting and performing and stuff when I was a kid and and through high school. Um, but I was very pragmatic. I was a kind of a pragmatic young person. And I um, as much as I liked the idea, it also seemed super unrealistic to me. So um, by the time I went to college, I started it in, in Arizona at Northern Arizona University. And that's where I went for the first couple of years because I had a full scholarship. And uh, I wasn't going to study theater. I just thought, what am I going to do with a degree in theater? Nothing. Um, but then I couldn't figure out what to major in. And I ended up like kind of taking a theater class and, you know, auditioning for a play or two. And then I was like, "Ugh, these are my people. I got to just, I guess I'm going to do this. Um, and so when, but, but when I moved to San Francisco, I dropped out of school. I was a very good student. Don't get the wrong idea, but I really wanted to live in San Francisco ever since I had visited when I was like 13. I just was so drawn to it. I think that happens to a lot of people with San Francisco. And, um, so I ended up moving there and establishing residency. So I had to work, you know, just put myself, um, up and, 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 pay for everything and and uh, do that for a year so that I could go as an in-state student because the cost is so much different. Um, but that at that point, I was so in love with San Francisco and I didn't, and for then I really was like, oh, theater degree, no way. Like this is going to be completely useless. Um, and so I had wanted to study interior design and architecture and um, and I had this kind of dream of like maybe owning my own little shop someday in San Francisco or being, you know, some, some sort of architect. And, um, but the, um, and all due respect to SF State because I, I do love SF State, but at the time their like interior architecture and architecture um, degrees were in, they fell under the home ec umbrella. Like you literally would get a home economics degree. And I was like, I can't do this. I don't know. I just can't, I can't get a home ec degree. That feels like it's a little bit of a joke. Um, and so, and I also had all of these credits for theater. So quite honestly, I was like, not, I just was, I really 
kind of backed back into doing performing and stuff. Like I, I was not a very, fo- I was not focused on that and I was kind of doing it for fun. And then we, you know, I was in a sketch group that got scouted by the Aspen HBO comedy festival and some managers that had come up and already kind of had a sense of San Francisco as being a great place to find um, new comedy to represent because like I'm trying to think of all the people that came from up there. It was like, Janine Garofalo and Patton Oswalt and Al Madrigal and Kamau Bell, all these people who yeah. came out of San Francisco. So I kind of got dragged to LA kicking and screaming. Um, right. I had just wanted to live in San Francisco. So that's a really long answer to your question. But when I moved to San Francisco, it was actually the polar opposite. It was like, I thought I was moving to San Francisco because there was no way I was ever going to do acting um, yeah. for a profession. Yeah. And well, you know, our past two guests actually were, um, you know, very, very much so Bay Area, like archetypes. Like we had a tech executive uh, two guests ago and our last guest was Lil B, who you may have heard of. He's a... Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So there actually was a tech boom an early dot com tech boom, like we, you know, they, when we talk about the dot com collapse, that ha- that had happened like right before I moved to San Francisco. Um, so I actually came at the end of like a different tech boom that sort of burst, um, and then and then it, you know, sort of ramped back up. But um, but I think I was close to leaving or had already left um, the city when it started getting really crazy back into tech. Like it, like it was pre, you know, pre Salesforce building, pre Twitter, like having a huge campus, you know, all of that stuff was still kind of in its early days. Um, but I still produce a comedy festival up there. So I, I go up there now and I have a sense of Yeah, I saw that. Now, how would you say like, you know, we've, I guess this is just now a running theme, but the gentrification that's happened there, was that like a huge thing when you were a student and how does it compare from then to now? Yeah, I felt like, um, well, I lived in the kind of middle of the city. Um, I lived between like Knob Hill and the Tenderloin, those two be, being like extremely close together, but sort of the polar opposites in that you can get in San Francisco. And it's such a small city anyway. Um, and so I was definitely like in the thick of it and I loved it. I mean, my neighborhood was so diverse. It really was like, you know, this Middle Eastern family owns the grocery store that I go to and this Korean family owns the video store. Yes, video store that I used to go to. And the, and right next to that was like the, the actual like first generation American Italian pizza place that I ate at. And so it was, it was, it was a really, really diverse place. And I think a lot of that, um, some of it has held on. And then, you know, to your point, a lot of it kind of got, um, kicked out for like, uh, you know, like very high end cafes or like wine tasting places or galleries or, you know, sneaker shops. Um, and so that has, you know, that was, that was definitely something to see. I still think as a city, it has, it's held on to its diversity better than, than certain other cities. Um, but, boy, is it expensive. I mean, you know, especially now because of what happens, very depressing, but so many places just had to shutter so quickly because it's such an expensive place to do business that, you know, it was like my friend who's lived up there for 40 years was like, I can't believe, like my dry cleaner just closed. I've been going to her for 35 years and it closed within like two weeks of COVID because we're just like, well, there was no margin for you know suddenly not being able to do anything for two weeks and earn and earn a living so i'm hopeful that it will kind of rise again and 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 if if the worst case scenario all of this kind of shakes it up and so people like artists and families and people are able to kind of come back into the city um at a lower rate of of living um that would actually be kind of a silver lining you know Well, I guess as someone who's probably somewhat plugged into like the artistic community, considering like, I think I saw something that said like the poverty threshold is like $90,000 or something. Is that presence still there? That's so crazy. Yeah, I think it's- I think it it, it probably is. I mean, when I lived there, um, I lived in a one bedroom apartment in 
again, like kind of where I lived was like, you know, could either be a really crap. Let's be like, my building was kind of okay. The building next to me was kind of crappy. And then the building next to that was like really nice. So it was just sort of all over the map, but it was like $850 a month for a one bedroom in San Francisco. And I'm sure that same apartment now is like $3,500. So I, yeah, I mean, we definitely like that, like the comedians, for example, the, the comics that I know that do the festival who are local, um, most of them cannot afford to live in the city at all, unless they've been there forever. Uh, but all the people who come to the shows, you know, who could afford to see live comedy uh, are, are, a lot of them are, are young tech people, you know? So, um, so yeah, I've, I, I would say that's, and you know, places like the mission that have really hung on um, as much as, I mean, people are constantly talking about it being uh, gentrified, but even still, there's been so many local businesses that have held on um, all these many years. And, uh, and again, I'm just hoping that they, they can maintain, but I, I'm sure that, that, that um, threshold is right. I mean, it's, it's so expensive. Yeah. Yeah, well, I guess kind of pivoting it back to like acting, um, you know, you had a few early big breaks with stuff like Catwoman and Entourage pre Cora. And did you feel as though you had made it when you had like gotten, you know, signed on to like big name brands like that with like TV shows? No, no, I definitely didn't. I didn't feel like I made it. I think feeling like you've made it is so subjective that, you know, there are people who feel like they haven't made it that have been like series regulars on like NBC hit shows for years, but really they want to be in the movies. So they haven't made it yet. Or, you know, somebody who like does a ton of commercials and, you know, does really well for themselves for a living, but secretly wishes they were the star of an animated show. Don't, they don't feel like they made it. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's so subjective. Um, and so that's, it's a funny term in that way. Um, I think I felt like if I had to pin down when I felt like I made it, honestly, it probably would be right around the era of Cora because that was in this cluster of time where I got Cora. I had already started my podcast. Um, I had just done a show called Burning Love that I just absolutely adored doing. And it was so much like my character was sort of so much from my heart and sort of, you know, created by me and felt very personal. And so I think for me, the feeling of making it is like when you're really proud of your work and you feel like you have a lot to do with why it's good or, or you just feel good about your own contribution. Um, like with my podcast, I won't say I feel like I'm the reason Core was good by any stretch of the imagination. I just think I hopefully didn't ruin it. Uh, but, but it was something I was so proud to be a part of. Um, they could have paid me like a dollar and animation is not a, a, you know, particularly fruitful, um, financial thing to be doing unless you're like, on a show that's been around forever. Um, but I would have gone for like a dollar an episode, you know, just to, just to be a part of it. And I probably would have paid them to be on Cora. Um, so, so that's a, that's kind of how I would characterize feeling like, okay, I've made it in the sense that I'm proud of it. I feel like I've, I, if I die tomorrow, I've left something behind that really feels like it's meaningful in a way that maybe some of the other stuff you get to do when you're an actor for a living, just, it doesn't hit you quite as hard. Well, well, how did you find out about like Cora? What was the initial like, you know, offer or like, how did you find out about it? And what was it like auditioning? Yeah. Um, I, I had just had a voiceover agent who, you know, was, was trying to get, um, trying to get their clients auditions and, um, Nickelodeon does have kind of a long history of really embracing the comedy world, even just like, you know, adult, Com comics, you know, like alt comedy, they've always mined those, those rooms, those people, those brains for a lot of their comedy going back to, you know, way before this, but even thinking about like Tom Kenny, who does SpongeBob, you know, he's just a hilarious comedian and musician in his own right. Um, and so they, Nickelodeon definitely took a chance on like, oh, I, you know, I hadn't done a ton of voiceover. I think I had done, I definitely had done a pilot with them before where I played like a really sarcastic unicorn um, and, uh, and a couple other things, but I hadn't done a ton. And, uh, and I just was, I felt so lucky that you know, for, for a role like that, that Mike and Brian and Nickelodeon weren't married to the idea of like, well, we have to get somebody who's been around, who's been doing cartoons for a million years because they're such titans 
of that world. And, you know, once you're good at it and once you show you have range, why hire anyone else? Because it's not like you're, you're hiring somebody who can do 50 different voices. So when I started auditioning for it, you know, it was a process and they did end up doing, like, I remember doing a sort of a chemistry read with um, David and PJ. Um, but I couldn't even believe I got to that point. Like every hurdle I, I overcame with that job, I kept thinking this will be the last like well that was fun to at least get to audition once well it was fun to get to meet the creators well it was fun to get to be in there with Nickelodeon well it was fun to get to you know each one I was like but that'll be the end of it and someone else will get it and then I got it yeah and what was that like it was insane I couldn't believe it I I couldn't believe it I I found out I was in a Joanne's fabrics because I like to craft like I would think I was in the midst of making maybe like making some I think I was doing this I did this weird kind of great gallery um show thing with uh with a friend and a bunch of artists and I think I was just buying a bunch of bits and bobs for whatever that was and my agent called me and um and I did that thing where I like jumped up and down and and sort of screeched before I realized I had done it and then I was super super self-aware right after that like oh this is super embarrassing and dirty um but yeah I, I, I couldn't believe it and then like any good uh actor my next thought was like I'm gonna get fired which is like a terrible attitude. Also, I have not been, like, that's not even that common, but you, there's so much, uh, it's, it's such a roller coaster doing this for a living. Uh, and, and so even if it hasn't happened to you, you always know someone who got fired after a table read or, you know, was let go after three episodes and they just realized they wanted to go in. And, and so the more you want something and the more excited you are about something, the more afraid you are that it's not real or that it's going to go away. So I like, I always joke that like up through the season finale of, of book one, I was still waiting for them to be like, okay, we're going to go ahead and replace you. Um, you know, just, we've got Carrie Fisher to do the, like, I was just always ready for that to happen. And the first time I saw an animation, you know, with my voice attached to it, of course, I just like started crying because I was like, oh my God, it's real. You know, and that's kind of what had to happen almost is to really see it live and to know other people were seeing it to go, oh, it really happened. This is real. Now, like, I guess that's one form of anxiety, but did you have like any anxiety like related to specifically taking over such a beloved brand? Because I remember oh, when I was yeah. a kid and it came out, like a lot of there was such a like mixed reaction amongst my friends who are, you know, probably 12 about right. whether or not, you know, um, you know, this was a good idea uh, because yeah. it was so beloved. And, you know, on top of the general anxiety, I guess you have is, you know, it being your career. Did you have anxiety for taking over such a like, you know, iconic kids brand? Absolutely. I mean, I, I just again, I just did not want to do anything that that I, I mean, I had read the script, you know, obviously by the time the show was, came out, um, I, we had worked on it and we had done a, you know, been like a year since we had first started recording the episodes. And I knew, I mean, I will always think that it's a fantastic show. I understand that it's divisive and I understand why. Um, but that, you know, I, I also feel like, uh, that's the kind of thing that's, I, I had to get good at understanding that that's what happens when you have something that people are passionate about. It, they're going to be, you know, it's, they're going to be always Trekkies who are like, no, no, this version of Star Trek is better than this version. Like, and I've never, I've never really been that person. I've usually been like, why do you have to choose? <laughs> like, why does it have to be a, an either or, or like, this is better than this. Um, but I think that that just happens naturally when you, you know, when you're a big a fan of, of something. Um, but every experience I had uh, for a very long time was super positive because I wasn't like, you know, mining the internet to find out what people didn't like about it. I'm just not that person. I'm not obsessive in that particular way. So. Yeah. Now, did, what about just like during the like original table readings and stuff like that? Was that just another pressure you know, on top of the general pressure? Um, I think I was so, I think the excitement overrode the anxiety um, in that particular way. Like I really, I just fell in love with Mike and Brian and I just didn't, I, I didn't doubt that the show itself would be great and that, that people would like it. I, I just wasn't, I was so all in that that I don't think was an, like that wasn't really an added anxiety. I definitely believed that it would, that it would be great. It was more just like me not wanting to screw it up. 
Well, I guess like going specifically to the show, do you have any favorite episodes or, you know, stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, it's so that's a really, really hard one to to categorize to kind of pick up pick apart because all of it is just so great and and um, so different. You know, the books are so wildly different one from the other. Um, so it's hard for me to really pick. But, you know, I mean, I was so excited to to go to, you know, the spirit world in, in season two and, and all of the stuff that was, that was happening and those kinds of big questions. I loved Amon. Um, I loved how terrifying Zaheer and his, and his hench people were and the creativity of, you know, bending with water when you don't have arms. Like there just, there's just so many elements that I was so wowed by, um, that I don't really have like, Oh, this episode, you know, or, Oh, like there's, there's little isolated moments. Um, but, but I've never been able to like set, set aside something. I mean, the first episode of the fourth season I thought was really powerful. Um, you know, that one really stuck with me. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess just kind of like talking about Korra specifically as a character, did you, um, I guess, do you, did you like the fact that, you know, you were the first female avatar voice, uh, you know, that people got a chance to hear? Cause I think, I don't think Kiyoshi was really voiced in heavily oh, yeah. in, in, in the first sh- sh- like show, right? Cause I yeah. think she was only in one or two episodes, but Roku exactly. and yeah. Aang, you know, were obviously quite pre- prominent. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was a big, that was a, uh, that felt like a really big deal. And that was a lot of what the conversation was, you know, when the, when the show first came out, there were the interviews that we were doing and, and, you know, the cons that I was doing, that was kind of the, at the forefront, right. Was like to be the, the, to be a girl, to be an avatar and to have her be a girl. And then also, you know, just the whole conversation that still happens about powerful female characters who can be complex, who can be flawed. Um, and maddening at times but to me that's what makes them relate relatable and that's what makes them inspiring i'm not super inspired by perfect characters um that feels unattainable you know somehow to me um but then and then as this series evolved um and to have the 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 pts that that Cora experienced and then to have her you know fall in love with asami a lot of the the conversations and the interviews and and the moments that were really powerful with fans in conventions became very specific to like oh my gosh not only is Cora this and this but she also went through this terrible thing and I went through a terrible you know those kinds of things um made it it was like oh my gosh I can't believe this got even more profound and more meaningful for me um with the layers of the show as it built up towards the finale you know yeah, and kind of staying on that topic, at least according to Wikipedia, it said that, you know, you identify as bisexual. Was it, you know, so what was the conversation like when people were talking about making Cora bisexual? Oh, I was, I just was so excited. I mean, Seychelle and I both were, we were really, really happy when Mike and Brian, and they did pull us aside, just the two of us, and we were at Nickelodeon, we kind of came out and had a conversation with them. And, um, you know, it's like... It, <sighs> I love, I love how fast, you know, bad things seem to sort of evolve quickly. Um, I'm thinking of the last couple of years, but so do good things in to the point where like now it just seems adorable that they would feel like, you know, they wanted to come in and sort of say like, this is where the show's going and we just wanted to let you know, and we've gotten Nickelodeon's blessing, but it is kind of hard and different because we're already such a grown up show for Nickelodeon. And, you know, they take, ch- they've already taken chances on both of these franchises because, um, you know, it's just not a, your normal Nickelodeon fair. And, but now it just seems adorable. Like, oh no, oh no, we had to have a whole conversation about them ending up together. Like it all read, that already feels quaint. You know, it already feels like, oh, thank goodness that's not as big of a deal as it was. Um, but those moments apparently need to exist for it to become more and more normalized, you know? So now you have shows like she and stuff and, and, and Rebecca Sugar's wonderful show, Steven Universe. And, um, uh, so yeah, so it was, it was, it really meant a lot to me because for my experience, when I was young, it seemed like every bi character was like the serial killer, <laughs> like the only bi representation you would see in television or movies would be somebody who like loved having sex with everyone was like, just not picky or was 
or both or was like you know a psycho killer or the villain or you know some there was like so much like turmoil to do with that and so every time i see uh, um a bi character represented male or female or anything in between that is just a, a human person with feelings and can but and, and all the normal amounts of confusion and and pathos and all that kind of stuff i'm like yes yeah yeah and you know kind of i think a lot of people would say that that was probably one of you know the moments that people will remember the most and it's probably part of the legacy of cora it was specifically like so. that last moment um and i guess kind of on that note what do you think the legacy of cora is going to be you know in the next you know recent future and i guess down the line sure well i i will say that you know i mentioned shira before and that's something that you know um that has been sort of openly acknowledged like oh you know the the last airbender and legend of Korra really influenced that show and inspired that show so you can kind of even see some of the actual you can sort of the tangible legacy if you will um of stuff that's kind of been openly acknowledged as like yeah this inspired me to create this other thing that that everybody loves but um but what i think has been so cool about it coming to netflix when it did is just how how relevant the conflicts, um, the big picture conflicts that happen in Korra, they feel just as important, if not more so than ever. Um, and so the fact that more people got to see it in this very hard time that we're all going through, um, that feels like, I, you know, it, it just feels like beautiful, perfect synergy in a way. Um, and I think that it will, I think that it does encourage, you know, I just had a conversation with somebody at an animation studio who was like, you know, we want to tell complicated stories that young people um, and their families and, you know, older people, people who don't have kids, like we realize with shows like that, that you can make something that's complex, that's not talking down to people, um, to young kids, you know, obviously I'm not saying like five-year-olds, but, uh, but taking the chance to talk about difficult stuff, you know, big picture stuff and, and a lot of ethical kind of questions and moral questions and, and to see like, no, people can handle it and they want it. They're, they, they want to have those conversations. And anything like that that I'm a part of that spurns those conversations, spurs them on and, and makes people feel like, you know, there's that you want to talk about it, you want to understand it, you want to think about what you would do in those positions is just part of, of us getting better as a, as a society, I think, or I hope. Yeah. And I guess kind of like on that note, you know, Avatar is such a like spiritual show. Did you like feel yourself getting more connected with, you know, anything related to spirituality throughout the production? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know that, I don't know that the show was necessarily a gateway. Everything just kind of felt like it was happening all at once. Um, but I certainly, I mean, my, I was, I had been working with a trainer. I had hurt my, my back, um, like just being a, you know, a dumb young 20 something, like just not taking care of my body and feeling like I was invincible and, there's nothing like hurting your back of all things to immediately feel like an old person. You're like, Oh my God, what this, this was so, I'm so fragile. What's happening. And so I had started working with a trainer just as almost like a, like physical therapy. And, um, and he was a very, he was very spiritual. Like he was very much about mind body and uh, not about pushing yourself in this way and forgetting about this. And it was all about balance. And so when I got Cora and I was describing to him what the show was, he was like, Oh, psh, you got this. Like you've already been training for this. Like you've been, you know, like managing your breath as you're kind of learning kickboxing moves and understanding how much the mind and body are connected and stuff. So it was this great journey that was kind of all happening um, concurrently, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess, you know, kind of transitioning away from Cora, just for a little bit of stuff that you've been doing after after Cora, I know you have Sketchfest and things like that, but what else have you been up to? Well, I, most of the stuff that I do has been on camera. So um, I love doing animation. I'm on a, a show that's on Quibi right now that comes out every day and it's called Your Daily Horoscope. And it's so funny. It's like The Office meets 
your horoscope it's or, or bojack horseman it's the it's their uh, it's will arnett's company that makes it and so every day 12 cartoons come out um about this office where all of these uh zodiac signs work it's so stupid and so funny um so that's been really really fun i do three different characters on that show um but before that i was on i had three seasons of a show called stand against evil which you can see on hulu it's perfect for halloween it was um uh, me with with john c mcginley who's um uh, was on Scrubs. A lot of people think of him as, as uh, what's his name? Doctor, oh my God, I'm forgetting his, his name. That sucks because I know what it is, but I can't remember. Um, and so I got to be a demon fighting sheriff on that show, which was super fun. It was action packed and I got to do some of my own stunts and stuff. So that was great. And then I was on a show for five years called You're the Worst, which um, starred Aya Cash, who's now one of the boys. She's a uh, uh, she's the very evil character of uh, Stormfront on on Amazon's The Boys. Um, I got to be on a show with her for five years, which was wonderful. And actually, Desmond Borges, who is on uh, Utopia, he's on Utopia. So it's like two Amazon like sci-fi fantasy shows have two of my favorite people from the show I used to be on. Um, so I was on You're the Worst. And, um, and then I made a show for IFC called Fortune Rookie uh, with a bunch of people from the show Psych. And and, you yeah, kind of, and then my podcast and a bit of an entrepreneurial thing with with Sketchfest, right? Oh, for sure, yeah, and for sure. It's just what my was little that business. Like stepping into you know outside of acting into like running something. Uh, it's totally different, and but it's really really helped. Like being a, a comedy event producer has, I think, helped me take things less personally in show business as well. It's like, okay, well, listen, if you can't sell enough tickets on my name, like that's not your fault, you know. So, I think I've understood, like, yes, there's a business side to this as well as it being really creative, um, and finding a way to marry those and understand all of that has only served me in in each direction. Um, I think it's made me a better performer, but it's also made me a better producer and writer um, at, to, to kind of get that big, that, that whole package. Uh, but that's what I've been doing since I was in college and now it's been like 20 years. So we're, we're like a 20 year old festival, but I still feel like we learn stuff every year, you know, cause it's just my two partners and me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the last part of the podcast is just advice for college students slash like young professionals. And I guess like one thing that would be really fascinating is just what is the difference between like voice and traditional acting for you? Um, well, oh gosh, they're both so satisfying for such different reasons. Um, there's something so magical about putting your voice to something and seeing a character on the other side of it that's either an animal or, uh, a, you know, what you would normally think of as like a non-living object or, you know, a character that is doing things you can never do. That's magic. I mean, that that really scratches the itch of like every kid playing pretend, you know, Um it's easier in the sense that, you know, I recorded, I did a movie that hasn't come out yet. And, you know, I recorded everything in a day um, versus working on a movie, you know, normally you'd be like, and I was six weeks on location and blah, blah, blah. Um, so it's easier in some ways. But whenever I do, whenever I've just been doing one or the other for a long time, um, I always miss the other thing so much because they they're so different i love perform i love improv i love i have a like very cartoonish face um i'm very rubber face and uh and i love working with other people physically in the space and i and that is different because when you go onto a set it's the other playing pretend part of the kid in you that's like, oh my gosh, this is, look at this like giant demon pig puppet that, you know, is like covered in slime. This is crazy. I can't believe I get to play pretend that I'm afraid of it. This is awesome. So um, they're, they're so different, but you know, you really have to figure out, there's a lot of technique to both and, and doing voiceover, I think you have to figure out um, how to kind of harness everything and keep it more contained in a way that um, that just takes time, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess, you know, kind of on that, um, you know, for anyone who's interested in getting into acting, what is some advice that you'd give uh, overall? And I guess in perhaps like a little bit more than the general, like, you know, just stay positive. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I would say don't stay positive. Stay very negative. I'm totally kidding. Uh, I, I say take an improv class and I am not alone when I say that whether or not you're interested in doing comedy at all, it is 
And frankly, I recommend it for even for people who aren't even interested in acting. There is something so special about improv and 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 the way that it really opens up your brain, A, to failure. Uh, many of us are so hard on ourselves that we feel like if we are going to do something in front of other people, it has to be perfect or it's not worth doing or, you know, you're afraid of being embarrassed. Um, and going through the process of learning how to improvise uh on the spot, which really is like a tremendous amount of training and experience that gets you to the point where you can be spontaneous in that way. Um, it just teaches you how to just utterly flop and be okay with it and feel the freedom that comes along with going, you know what, I'm not going to be good at this right away. And that's okay. And I'm going to find moments in that. And it, and it, and it teaches you how to listen better you know, we are all living in a world where it's so easy to be thinking about 80 different things. You're on your phone, you're doing this. When you're improvising, you are there. And I find that to be extremely meditative. Like for me doing an improv show, everything else has to stop. And I'm just connecting with this other person. And I think that gives you a profound ability to do that in any situation, whether you just got pulled over <laughs> And like, you just want to like be a human being to a human being, or, you know, you're doing an audition or you're trying to land a job as a lawyer, you know, when is that not going to be useful? So I, I love, love, love improv. Um, it's hard to take live right now for obvious reasons, but even now, like, I think the second city is offering online improv classes, you know, there's still work you can do, um, to, 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 to go forward. And, always voiceover actors recommend improv because so much of what ends up getting you a job is if you have the ability to be playful and um, listen to the direction you're given, right? Huge. Um, you do get that from improv. And, and if you can riff a little bit in the spirit of the show or in the spirit of the character, um, that brings it to life a little bit more for somebody. And so they might get a different sense of, Oh, I saw, I saw something. She just made that joke. And, and I saw something in there that feels right, you know, for this character and it sets you apart. So you still respect the material, but it gives you the, and, and also people often say, well, I like that, but could you do it a little bit more mm, contemplatively? Um, that improv muscle is like, oh, I didn't, I didn't practice the audition the same way 80 times. So now I'm, it's rote and I can't do it any other way. You have that flexibility to go like, you know what? Yes, I can do it the other way. Sure. Let's see what happens. Yeah, yeah. And I guess, you know, kind of on this topic, were you, did you ever have stage fright? Because I feel like you kind of come across as being pretty confident and you probably have to be confident for, you know, improv in general, at least when you're performing in front of other people. And I know you mentioned improv can help with that. But is that something that, you know, you always had? And do you ever get it still? I, I tend to feel pretty comfortable in front of a group, um, but I have definitely had like full on panic attacks, like on stage in front of people. It's really hard and it's really scary. Um, I, 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 anybody who ever goes through anything like that, like I feel it in my gut. I've been there. Um, improv, another great place to, to find that out, you know, to, to sort of find out how to manage that and to work with what you've got at any given moment. Um, some of my favorite improvisers, like on my podcast, uh, I did an interview with P Colin Mockery, who's been around forever and he's just this amazing improviser. He's like, whose line is it anyway? Um, like the funniest dude. And he's like a very, very shy, very quiet person. And he was like, I did not know what hit, like what was happening to me when I started do performing because he never felt like he had the ability to do that. And sometimes if you give yourself the chance to, to explore that, even if you don't necessarily feel that you have that confidence, um, there, you might crack open a part of you that you didn't even know was there. Yeah. Well, I guess like the final question I have is, you know, I think a lot of like the, the vibe of core, at least going into it was taking over a beloved space. And that kind of happens, you know, in a lot of different ways. Like, you know, as you enter the workplace, you kind of enter, other people's spaces and there's other different like you know there may have your boss may have been popular and then he's retiring and you take over his you know his job so do you have any advice for like just entering a space that people you know really like or you know taking over for someone who is really well liked or taking over that's for a, a show yeah. that was really cool that's a great that's a great way of kind of turning it into something um bigger and and something relatable um again i would just go back to like 
I mean, obviously respect is a huge, is a huge one. It's just, you know, do the opposite of what Cora did, you know, don't blaze in there. Like we all love on the avatar, you got to deal with it. But obviously that was like very hard. You know, that was a thing she had to undo for years. Um, you know, you have to, I think finding that balance again, balance, capital B balance, but finding that balance of, of, of being deferential and respectful knowing that you're coming into a new environment yet at the same time being able to balance that side by side with having the confidence and the inner strength to know that yes just because i'm listening to you and i want to make sure you feel heard and i want you to know i see you and i'm and i want to and i want us to have a relationship of some kind that's positive that you also have that core of who you are so that you're not saying like here i am tell me what you want me to do and be you know and and that's a thing that i think we all work our whole lives on but um but coming in and you know letting having that nervousness and knowing that nervousness is there and and still just setting it off to the side going, okay, feeling, I have you, I got you, I'm new, this is scary, rather than, you know, dealing with that, like, well, then I'm going to throw this at you because uh, I don't know what else to do. Or like, okay, I'm just going to tuck it in here and then I'm just going to come from that place. It's like, okay, now you go over here and now I'm listening and I'm present and I'm not, I'm not being ruled by my, my, my fear or my emotions, I'm, but I'm acknowledging it and I'm working through it. And assuming that the other person isn't a jerk, you know, let them prove to you if they're not a good person. Don't, you know, you don't have to come in on the defense all the time, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, any, any advice for the class of 2020 in general entering this? Oh my gosh. Day? I mean, I, I would just, I, I don't, I'm like, here's how I feel about 2020 class. Um, I'm going to be coming to you guys for advice because you are overcoming something so uh, unique and so strange and confusing that the adults around you who have been functioning as adults in the real world post school for way longer are like, what do we do? And so I think you having this happen to you now, while is extremely weird and off putting uh, and unfair, um, I think it's going to grow you in ways that, you know, I'm going to be in awe of how you guys handle stuff and then in the years to come, because you've taken on this, this spectacular change. And I, I have no doubt that you're going to come out on the other side of it, um, stronger and better for it. And so I, I'm excited to admire all the good things that come out of you guys tackling this time in our, in our lives and in your lives. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming on the podcast. My pleasure.